I want to tell you a little bit about the origins of the conference and then provide an introduction to our first two presenters. Um, when Jeff stepped down as dean and set up this new center, he told me without asking me that I'd been appointed a senior fellow. <laughs> and I thought, well, do I get anything? And they told me like I would get business cards. Uh, <laughs> Mickey knows, you know, it's very exciting. Uh, but then he invited me over here for a meeting and I said, he has a house, you know, um, let's do something useful with it. And so we brainstormed and came up with the idea of what is now the first annual conference on media and a major political and international issue. Yes, we've made up a title and... Uh, <laughs> But the real focus of the conference today was actually initiated by my friend Ambassador Mort Abramowitz, who had written an op-ed piece expressing his exasperation that the media was not doing a very good job at reporting nor analyzing the war in Afghanistan, and in particular the U.S. involvement. And he said, well, where he, should he put it and should he put it on the Huffington Post or wherever? And I said, well, wherever it gets published, Mort, uh, we may have a conference about it and you have to come. And so he is here. And in a moment, I'll give him a chance to express himself in more detail. Um, tell you a little bit about Ambassador Abramowitz. He's one of the most distinguished American diplomats. He served as ambassador to Thailand and to Turkey, who was head of intelligence and research department in the State Department during the, what we'll call the first Afghan war against the Soviet forces. He played some key roles that uh, were then secret but are now more public if you read carefully some of the books about it. And when he left the government, he founded a new organization called the International Crisis Group which is one of the most important international NGOs that reports and analyzes what's going on in hot spots all over the world. He was also head of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And luckily for us, he has grandchildren in LA, so it isn't hard to woo him. His daughter, Rachel, is the lead entertainment reporter. Some of you may know her, Rachel Abramowitz, for the Los Angeles Times. So we're going to have Mort go first, and then, without getting discussion and question and answer, go to Bill Schneider. Many of you know that Bill Schneider, for two decades, has been the senior political analyst for CNN. I believe he is the single best political analyst in the United States. He started out as an undergraduate at Brandeis, where he remembers the first week being recruited for Freedom Rides. That's what happened in the 60s. You uh, didn't just join a fun club, you joined a cause. He went on to a PhD in politics at Harvard. He tried his hand at being a professor for a while and uh, found it a little boring and started to write for The Atlantic and other journals. And then television discovered him and he discovered television. He's known affectionately to his friends is El Pandito. <laughs> I had him over at Occidental yesterday giving a brilliant analysis of domestic issues in the recent elections. And what Bill will do for us is summarize and analyze public opinion about the war and about the way in which the public is thinking or not thinking about the upcoming decision that President Obama is going to be making. Um, I don't have to tell all of you that a decision by a president to send young American men and women into further harm, we already have a presence there, but to make a commitment or a decision is no small thing for the United States. And there are obvious consequences about these kinds of decisions when you are still the lone superpower and their consequences, not just for the United States, but for our allies, because this is the first time in which Article 5 of the NATO Treaty 
has actually been exercised. And we have NATO allies serving with us and are looking to see what our actions will be. And then there's always domestic politics, as we know from the Pentagon Papers and a careful study of decision making during the Vietnam era, presidents are also politicians and they are always mindful, as Mickey Cantor and others know, of the domestic consequences of foreign policy decisions. So many, many forces come into play in this country, a country that was once rather quiet and at peace. When I first visited in 1971, as a student journalist, I went to the 4th of July party at the American Embassy in Kabul. And the major issue that the embassy faced was hearing from parents whose sons or daughters had passed through on the sort of hippie trail. Um, it wasn't yet seen as somehow a fulcrum or a locale of a surrogate war in the Cold War or now perhaps or perhaps not, a central war in the former war on terror, whatever we're now calling it in this new period. So I think we're very lucky to have such a good group as all of you and distinguished presenters. And also our timing couldn't have been better. That's not our fault, it's the president's fault because some people say he's been dithering, other people saying he's been very careful and considerate. I can tell you that since he studied at Occidental College, he does consider things very carefully. Um, we hope he's learning something from the eighth briefing. Somebody asked me the other day, what doesn't he know already that he hasn't been told by his experts? And uh, when Admiral Fallon comes up as our first responder, uh, maybe he'll tell us what presidents keep asking them that they don't already know about this situation. And also, I think it's incredibly important when these kinds of decisions are going to be made that we ask ourselves, has there been adequate debate or discussion in our own country? Some of you may know that Senator Kerry was going on the other day about how proud he was of these hearings that he had held on Afghanistan. And he compared them to the Fulbright hearings on Vietnam. Well, I don't remember the hearings. Did he have hearings? It's, you know, were they these dramatic hearings with experts coming before the Senate? If it happened, nobody noticed. So we now know people are paying attention. Um, so first, Ambassador Abramowitz will frame the discussion and take full credit for uh, bringing us all here today. Mort. Thank you, Derek, for that introduction, and Jeff, for inviting me here. I think uh, this conference uh, can be a very important one. It's a critical subject, the adequacy of the press, the adequacy of the media in dealing with a profound issue of war and peace. I uh, somewhat uh, feel very diffident uh, talking about this subject. Uh, I'm neither a media maven nor a specialist on Afghanistan. Uh, but I have followed with increasing anger <laughs> uh, the, the way the media has covered the policies of the Obama administration their, and their inadequacies. And I believe there has been a, a big problem with the media in Afghanistan in general, particularly after the first flush of war. So I have been studying it. Uh, and unfortunately, I've been traveling, and in the last, so I've been home only three days, but I decided the best thing, and I hope you will bear with me, is to work out my thoughts uh, in, a, in a much structured speech, uh, uh, which I think uh, will explain why I am so bothered. Uh, let me state the limitations of my comments. Uh, mine is an informal, broad, and somewhat impressionistic view of the media's examination and reporting of what the U.S. government is proposing and doing. I'm a devout media consumer, and by the media I'm talking about here, the mainstream 
media in Washington, New York, the major newspapers, a few magazines, the bigger networks. Uh, I'm a devout reader of them and, and viewer, uh, but hardly, as I said, a detailed media analyst. Uh, and with a few exceptions, I'm not going to cite chapter and verse. As for Afghanistan, as, as uh, Derek referred to, I spent a good portion of the years, 1985 to 89, helping arm the Afghan resistance as head of the State Department's Intelligence Bureau and know a good number of the very unsavory people now fighting us in Afghanistan today. I also recently spent four days in Kabul talking to many Afghans, the humanitarian community, senior American officials, and other foreign officials. Now let me say that nothing I say today indicates what I think should be done in Afghanistan. I'm trying to give you my dispassionate view of what's wrong with the American press on Afghanistan. Uh, first, a little history. This is the third American war in the last 50 years which has created great public anxiety and division. One common factor is that none of these wars played to our strong suits. They were all in areas we know little about, scurried around for knowledge and linguistic capacity, and introduced American political assumptions into our analysis of the situation that were usually irrelevant or wrongly applied. In all three wars, the press generally started out in support of the war and largely turned against it, not yet in Afghanistan, and largely turned against it or became, sometime, became skeptical sometime after the war had begun. Certainly that was true in Vietnam. David Halberstam, a major chronicler of American of American Vietnam was among the most enthusiastic of reporters initially in early urging that the war, if it, was, if it was prosecuted vigorously and differently, the United States would be successful. That attitude soon changed and the press in New York, Washington and Saigon largely turned against the war and the famous five o'clock follies, some of which you probably never heard of, some of you here probably never heard of, in Saigon for the American press. And, they, and they, they moved in part because of government mendacity and developments on our campuses. It became definitive after Tet, when Walter Cronkite virtually pronounced the war as unwinnable. The written history shows a continuing, written history on Vietnam, a continuing division over the outcome of the war and the role of the media in that outcome. In, Af in Afghanistan, after the, after the initial victory, and the uh, media, and thus the country, virtually abandoned interest and turned its attention and resources to the bigger issue of the day, Iraq. While they were initially mostly supportive and gave the administration and its arguments over WMD and supposed Iraq's support of terrorism, a very wide swath, particularly Colin Powell's address in the United Nations. As soon as the war stalled, violence emerged, and our intelligence analysis on WMD proved wrong. A cottage industry grew up on the failure of the press to argue, to focus on the run-up to the war. And articles still appear on it. My good friend Les Gelb had one about six months ago. Now attention has again focused on Afghanistan, our conduct of the war, and our efforts or lack thereof. Clearly, as Derek pointed out, in all three wars, domestic politics has had enormous influence over what administrations decide, but that is not easy for the press to factor in to its, uh, to its writings dispassionately. In all three cases, the big public issues became similar over the course of the war. Do we pursue the goals we started with or do we adjust or abandon them? If we decide to change or abandon goals, the consequences are inevitably, inevitably described either as extraordinarily bad, including in the case of Afghanistan, 
not only the loss of American credibility, but the Talibanization of Afghanistan, Pakistan, and even Central Asia, Al-Qaeda running amok again in Afghanistan, and the destruction of Pakistan. Or such consequences are described as vastly exaggerated, as they clearly were by Henry Kissinger in the arguments over Vietnam. And the view set forth that different, less costly strategies can be found to mitigate adverse consequences, or domestic political concerns are so great that there is simply a necessity uh, to end the war. Excuse me. Let me now go, finally, to my disenchantment with the press coverage of the Obama administration Afghan policy. It started for me right away with the virtual buy the press gave to the new Afghan strategy enunciated by the president and by his senior officials in March. Neither the daily press nor the pundits serious, seriously pursued the basic question. Who is the real enemy and how serious is the problem? How much money, how many forces, for how long, with what strategy, and to what end? Indeed, much of the press got the strategy largely wrong. Sorry. <laughs> Damn. No, Dick Holbrook. <laughs> uh, where was I? I oh, they, they got the strategy largely wrong. Reporting the new policy, precisely as the administration emphasized, as mostly narrowing our aims by publicly focusing on, counter, on countering Al-Qaeda. In fact, damn. <laughs> These former people are hopeless without staff. <laughs> In fact, the Obama administration was actually Bush heavy, not Bush light. It involved a civilian surge for the huge task of building a functional central government with control over its territory. After 30 years of war, terrible rule, and a country with pervasive literacy and a declining situation, security situation. I do not know, I don't know now from the press whatever happened to the civilian surge. I see no reporting on it. Got a lot of attention for about a month and then it vanished. So I don't know how many people are there, what they're doing, and how effective it is. There are other questions that bothered me that the press seemed not to raise. I have. Oh, sorry. Let me backtrack for a minute. I mixed up my pages. Some media passivity can be attributed to the slack given a new president inheriting a difficult war, especially a popular one, deeply concerned with the issue, studying it intensively, and assembling a new and dynamic team. Everyone was intellectually impressed, not prose to cavil, and uncharitably, perhaps fearful at an early time of their access if they raised too many questions. The new policy was accepted at face value. Indeed, a member of our top commentators were taken early on by Dick Holbrook on his first visit to AFPAC, and most of them rapturously declared the earth had moved. This is not to denigrate Holbrook. He's a longtime friend and an outstanding official who makes things happen. And it will, but he was showing again that he's also a superb press minder. I was only commenting on the absence of judgment of the pundits. Hit and run breathless descriptions by top columnists taken on Pentagon arranged tours or visits to new schools for girls substituted for serious consideration of policy. One famous columnist saw a girl's school in, in Kabul came away saying this is adequate reason for staying in Afghanistan. Well, I'm a big fan of humanitarian intervention, but I don't think I would make that sort of analysis. 
Perhaps worse has been the lack of questioning of the, what the administration was telling Congress. I said to a senior official, how can you ask for only seven and a half billion dollars for Pakistan over five years, or for more assistance for rebuilding Afghanistan and putting in more forces, and actually convey to Congress that early progress in Afghan, Afghanistan was possible with a civilian surge? He responded, what are we supposed to do? Tell Congressman Obi that we need to be in Afghanistan 10 years and $50 billion is necessary for Pakistan? That's a very cogent argument. And if I were in his case, I may have well made the case. But it's not a good argument for the long term. As for the press, there was hardly a peep on, on, on the discussion of what the administration was telling Congress. Then there's the Afghan election, which my friend Peter Galbraith and our previous speaker may totally disagree with me. The notion that a decent election could be held amidst a seriously declining security situation with extraordinary opportunities for cheating and significant corruption boggled my mind. Uh, yet the US government insisted on going ahead with the election, corralling money and support from other countries exceeding $300 million. Christ, how many schools could we have built with $300 million? The election was provided for in the Constitution, and the administration apparently thought it would be a defining moment, which it was, but not the one they wanted. There was ample reason to postpone and move toward an interim coalition followed by something like an emergency lawyer jerga until a decent election could be held. And today, the notion of legitimacy is heard in our land and in Afghanistan. Well, it seems to me it looks now that Karzai is now less legitimate. So having kicked Karzai firmly in the behind, we declare him the real ruler. But there is little else, quite frankly, we can do. We have to work with him. The press has focused on this issue, on the, the current anomaly, quite a bit. But asked few questions previously about going ahead with the election. Only when the initial massive cheating was exposed did the press begin to play, pay closer attention. What, what went before in the press mostly extolled the extraordinary nature of the effort and the extent to which the US government was trying to do something about it. There were other questions. I'm sorry to go on with this litany, but, <laughs> uh, but it's important. Uh, that bothered me about the press, and they did not seem to raise it. And maybe my, our speaker today, Bill Fallon, can throw some light on it. It's not so much a press question as it is a general question. Why does it take so long to train Afghans who have been fighting each other for 30 years? Taliban fighters don't have lengthy training, as far as I know. They don't go to Fort Leavenworth. They were basically seem to get to know their comrades better and learn how to use weapons. While it is true that there are problems of literacy, and Kabul may be the only place to have uh, some literate policemen, uh, perhaps we ought to really deeply examine what we, are trying, what we are training for. And in that case, let me raise another thing which has bothered me. The United States has roughly almost the amount of forces, with NATO forces, maybe more, the forces that the Soviets had. The United States has immensely more firepower, better intelligence. The, the, uh, those fighting the Soviets got in the last, in, by 1985, 86, 87, one billion dollars annually in assistance. The Taliban, they don't get a billion dollars. I don't know how much they get. Most of it they probably get from, from, from running uh, drugs, and maybe some from Pakistan. But it, 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 I have difficulty understanding why they keep winning, and we seem to be having great difficulty coming to grips with it. I'm maybe totally ignorant about something and missing something, but it's a subject that has bothered me. As for take, and now we have corruption as a theme of the hour. Every media outlet, as well as all friendly governments, editorialists and columnists alike, are co Gordon Brown calling on Karzai, stop corruption. 
How that is going to be done amidst massive narcotics production and massive aid expenditures, uh, the US government ex not explained, nor has Washington reporters asked about it. Then there's also the matter of drones and the killing of non-combatants. Few columnists and reporters pursued questions of their political impact, their legality, and their morality. I don't mean to sound like a goody two-shows. These are important questions. Jane Mayer did it in some detail in New Yorker several weeks ago, although the press has certainly reported incidents of collateral damage from Afghan-based reporters. But it, the editorialists have come to believe, apparently, that as long as there's such bad guys as Taliban and Al-Qaeda running around, anything goes. I saw a few editorials on the subject expressing concern, but not calling for any reconsideration. Lastly, on this litany, I have to go to the Swat Valley, <laughs> which became a passion for me. Very and I was very unsuccessful in getting attention. Some two million people were displaced, often in the face of air and artillery attacks. Little was done to prepare for the exodus, and little equally done to prepare for their return, while the SWAT economy has been impaired for a very indefinite time. The operation was hailed as a success by both the American and Pakistan governments, certainly. Getting Pakistan to go after the Taliban and SWAT was a great boom to the citizens and a real success for American policy. And I think American policy has had some success in Pakistan, uh, which the other administration, which is about the pits of any, any management that I've seen in 50 years in Washington, uh, administrations have done much better on that score than I ever believed they could. Uh, but the manner of the operation was egregious, and the returns of the attack are not yet in. I was amazed by a piece by an outstanding columnist, a really good columnist, who traveled several miles into the Swat Valley with a very articulate Pakistan general who I would call, from my East Asian days, the Pak military's barbarian manager. The general convinced the columnist, that the whole episode was a fantastic achievement and that the people of SWAT loved the, uh, loved the army and the place was coming to great life. The general, uh, the columnist concluded that the United States should adopt such a posture in Afghanistan. I certainly doubt General McChrystal with his emphasis on protecting the public, protecting the Afghan citizens would have done so. I might add I failed miserably to get a newspaper to write an editorial on SWAT's humanitarian debacle. Today, we still know what little goes on north of Mingora, the major city in SWAT, and many displaced have still not returned. In the adjacent districts, which the PACs also attacked, large numbers have been displaced. They have never returned, and nobody knows for sure where they are. And today, the same thing is happening, much smaller scale, in South Waziristan, where the PACs are quite rightly, the question I'm raising is how they're doing it, going after the Taliban, and large numbers have been displaced, and nobody knows where they're at. Clearly, to be fair on that score, let me go back to the back score. Correspondents can't go into SWAT. A few of them could go into the big city, Mingora, under very, very uh, controlled conditions. A few of them can get into South Waziristan. The Pakistan press is a, is a, on these issues, is an agent of the Pakistan government. So finding out what's happening is an extremely hard problem. Now clearly there has been much improvement in recent press coverage on Afghanistan 
there and here. Uh, despite financial difficulties, many major papers have poured more on the ground personnel into Afghanistan. The nature of the war has been brought home to the public by the embedded reporter, now a standard of all war reporting, although embedment has its embedded problems. More attention has been usefully focused on the Afghan effort, uh, on the issue rather of fundamental strategy. Uh, that is the present focus and that's very good. The other major issues of the Afghan effort still seem to me mostly unchanged and unelaborated. What the threat really is, how it best can be contained, what we propose to build in Afghanistan, and what it will take in resources and manpower to secure that and over what time period. The administration has a tendency to fend off those questions. Mr. Obama's coming decision on strategy for Afghanistan offers another opportunity for the media to ask the basic questions. And I guess the ultimate proof, maybe not, but a proof of press omission is that Mr. Obama himself decided, I think very judiciously, on the need to review his original policy. Now, let me just close by raising two questions, leaving two questions. Uh, which have bothered me and has been raised by my review of the past year. It is not surprising for reporters to become champions of one side or the other over the critical issue of war. It's a really big issue. And for them, going against the sort of press orthodoxy my question is, is that so bad? I'm not sure anymore that it's so bad. But uh, all of you who are members of the press and follow it, uh, I think it's worth reconsidering. Secondly, is the question of the morality of our wartime actions. We have had endless discussions on Guantanamo and on torture. Endless discussions, endless editorials, which was illegal, immoral, and destructive of America's international standing. In the case of our actions on, in AFPAC, from drones killing bystanders to the massive displacement of people, which we have encouraged by our inadequately preparing the Pakistanis. We have had little public discussion, although material and law would both have plenty to study. I would guess that the New York Times would wring their hands about civilian losses from the drones, but not suggest stopping, while the Washington Post would endorse the fight against terrorism. There simply doesn't seem to be any interest within the press to pursue such uncomfortable issues. And that's in great part because the other guys are so bad. And anything done to get those other guys is deemed satisfactory. And if the press has no interest in these, it's very difficult to generate much, generate much interest on the part of the public or on the part of the US government. Uh, Maybe another sort of watchdog is needed. Thank you. Well, Mort has raised lots of questions, and I know we're going to get into all of them. But first, I want Bill Schneider to come up and give us a sense, given the job the press has or hasn't been doing, what the public, the US public, thinks about the war. Bill? One of the first lessons I ever learned in journalism was three data points constitutes a trend. So last weekend, I didn't escape to notice that there were three big stories. Gavin Newsom, Didi Skotsafava, and Abdullah Abdullah. 
And I said, aha, a trend. They all pulled out of their respective races. What do they all have in common? None of them is Jewish. Um, none of them could raise very much money. I thought there must be a trend here somewhere because in, in every case, an election result was uh, more or less determined by the fact that uh, uh, three sig significant figures had withdrawn from the race. I'll leave it to you to analyze what the greater meaning of this is, but there is a trend. Uh, let me take you back uh, to a very significant point in public opinion and foreign policy, which is the uh, issue I was asked to address, a uh, very significant year in American foreign policy, and that was 1991. I always ask students, you know, there were two significant events in 1991. Most of them get the first one. They have no recollection of the second. Uh, in 1991, nearly 45 years after the Cold War began, the United States enjoyed two great triumphs. One was in the Persian Gulf, where President George Bush, the first George Bush, announced, by God, we've kicked the Vietnam syndrome once and for all. The other was in Moscow on Christmas night, 2000, uh, 1991, Christmas night, when the president announced on that night in a national television address what eight presidents before him could only dream of saying. He said, my fellow Americans, the Soviet Union is no more. Imagine. But he quickly changed the subject. He changed the subject to the economy, which of course was in deep recession, and that was the issue Americans were bothered by. The speech was quickly forgotten. It bothered my boss, Ted Turner, so much, he ended up spending $100 million to make a 26-part television series on the Cold War because he said, Americans need to know that for almost 50 years we fought this war and we've enjoyed a significant military victory. It almost passed unnoticed here in the United States. And that began a, a decade of withdrawal. It was almost exactly a decade. It started on December 25th, 1991 with the collapse of the Soviet Union. It ended on September 11th, 2001 uh, with the attacks in New York and Washington. It was, I call it, a fantasy decade. It was very much like the 1920s. It was an interwar era when prosperity reigned in this country and the rest of the world seemed very, very far away. That's a period, that decade, when Americans became quite complacent. I use that word very carefully. It was a decade of great public complacency. The country, that was when I went into television, starting in 1990. Uh, and the public, I can assure you, was obsessed with strange, sometimes outlandish events, starting, well, it was actually October 1991, with the Clarence Thomas confirmation hearings, the first live event I ever covered on television, one of the most remarkable public circuses we've experienced. It was the 1990s version of the Scopes trial of the 1920s. The 90s were a boom decade. The country was obsessed by things like, well, we spent a year and a half covering O.J. Simpson, and then there were some tragedies, Princess Diana, there was Whitewater, Monica Lewinsky, the death of JFK Jr., Elian Gonzalez, remember him? Uh, it ended with the coverage, the obsessive coverage of Gary Condit uh, leading up to September 11th, 2001. President Clinton actually pleaded with Americans for engagement in the world. He said, choosing isolation over engagement would not make the world safer. It would make the world more dangerous. But Americans, as we know, were very wary of risk taking in places first like Somalia and then Bosnia especially because Americans did not feel threatened. Clinton himself said it is an extraordinary moment when there is no overriding threat to our security. Now, he should have known better. In fact, he did know better, and he tried to plead with Americans to take the threat seriously. You remember the first World Trade Center bombing was in 1993, uh, and it was a warning to the United States. We treated that not as the beginning of a war on terror, but as a crime which was successfully prosecuted, uh, and it went away, it left the agenda. When the Soviets withdrew from Afghanistan, we all know, in 1989, the United States lost interest. Chaos followed, a takeover by radicals. But it, I think it was not meddling in the world that got the United States in trouble in this decade. It really was complacency. In fact, I remember a few months before 9-11, uh, the former Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, published a book asking this question. The title was, Does America Need a Foreign Policy? Imagine, he published this in 2001, the spring of 2001. Does America need a foreign policy? Because the question was very relevant at that moment. And then we, of course, got the answer on September 11th when we were blasted out of complacency, as we were earlier once before in Pearl Harbor. Uh, once again, we felt threatened, and once again, the country got engaged. 
And we know the Bush administration knew, used 9-11 not only to make the case for engagement, but also as a pretext for the war in Iraq. And then we began a familiar cycle. The Vietnam syndrome meant that every time the possibility of military intervention came up, the question was always raised by the press and by voters too, is this another Vietnam? And now they're talking about the Iraq syndrome, same question, different war. Disillusionment with Iraq came about fairly quickly after the mission was accomplished, in quotes, in 2003. The Iraq insurgency convinced more and more Americans that what had been a military war had turned into a political war. And one of the important rules in public opinion is a very simple one. Americans hate political wars. We hated a political war in Iraq. We hated a political war in Vietnam. And a lot of Americans are very concerned that Afghanistan is yet again a political war. Americans believe wars should be fought for military victory. I remember going out as long ago as 1968 in New Hampshire and asking people, many hawks voted for Eugene McCarthy. And I said, uh, well, you know, wh why are you voting for McCarthy? He said, I just want the war over. We should be fighting for military victory. We should win or get out. I don't know if I'm a hawk or a dove. Americans hated political wars then. They hated political wars now. And they see er uh, Afghanistan as becoming more and more of a war for someone else's politics rather than our own security. And that's a real danger. Uh, there were two real surprises that I can think of about the Iraq war um, that I've seen just in the past uh, couple, few years. One was, of course, the American voters in, two, in the midterm election of 2006 cast a very definitive vote against the war in Iraq. It was one of the most clear uh, mandates I've ever seen in an American election. They took Congress out of the hands of Republicans who had controlled it for 12 years, turned it over to the Democrats. The message was couldn't be clearer. It was all about ending the Iraq war. And then the President of the United States did something quite remarkable. Uh, essentially, he expressed defiance of the public mandate and talked about a surge in Iraq. And there was, at that moment, an explosion of rage in this country that I have really never seen before uh, in American politics, because this was a president who literally defied the will of the voters in calling for the Iraqi surge. Then something else happened. The surge, we are told, succeeded, at least temporarily, at least militarily, in, for the time being, bringing greater security to Iraq. And then the issue disappeared. It really didn't play much of a role. It helped Barack Obama get the Democratic nomination as being one of the first to speak out against the war in Iraq. But after that, by the time the election came around next year, the Iraq issue had vanished. It just wasn't a big factor in the campaign. It wasn't a big factor in the election. It had really disappeared. Americans do care about the rest of the world. They're willing to take decisive action when, they're willing, when they are convinced they can make a difference. In 1992, the public did support U.S. intervention in Somalia, and the reason for that was really the pictures. They saw terrible pictures of people starving, and they wanted to resolve a humanitarian catastrophe. You remember, just before he left office, the first President Bush called for the United States to intervene in Somalia and said we would leave Bosnia to the Europeans, which we did, and a terrible tragedy occurred. Uh, in Somalia, the pictures of humanitarian suffering were very dramatic, but Americans believed that that was kind of a natural disaster. It was a humanitarian case where we could come in and bring aid, and we discovered far too late that the cause of the disaster in Somalia was politics. It was caused by politics, by clan warfare, and suddenly we were involved in another country's politics and Americans just wanted to get out. They, we, we supported the bombing campaign in Serbia to stop ethnic cleansing in Bosnia. And once again, it was the pictures. They came from the BBC in that instance, people being shoved into trains. It was very reminiscent of Holocaust uh, memories and pictures. And Americans once again thought we have to stop this humanitarian uh, catastrophe, but again, drew the line at becoming involved in any other country's uh, politics. That's why we had turned against the war in Vietnam and the intervention in, in Somalia and the war in Iraq. We weren't fighting to win we were taking sides in another country's civil war. Well, the war in Afghanistan came on the agenda shortly after uh, Barack Obama took office. Um, and there's something important you have to know about the way Afghanistan has really entered the political debate. And it's this. To many, many Americans this year, Afghanistan is a new war. It's a new war. We've been there for eight years which is almost as long, I think we're 10 years since beginning with the escalation in Vietnam in 1965, that war wasn't resolved for 10 years. We've been in Afghanistan for eight years, but it's a new war. It was front and center 
on the nation's radar screen for just a few months after September 11, 2001. U.S.-led military strikes began in October 2001. By December, early December, the Taliban was ousted, and for the next five years, Iraq dominated the foreign policy agenda, and Afghanistan became the forgotten war. Now, what's important, I, I noticed that um, recently David Ignatius, a Washington Post columnist, uh, got hold of this strategy memo that General McChrystal it was classified, uh, his counterinsurgency strato mem strategy memo that he uh, brought to Washington, and he quoted the headline from that memo, which said, quote, protecting the people is the mission in Afghanistan. The conflict will be won by persuading the population, not by destroying the enemy. That's the definition of a political war. That's what a political war is all about. Persuading the population, not destroying the enemy. That's the kind of war Americans hate. And once again, the United States seems to be fighting to build confidence in the government of another country, just like we tried to do in Vietnam and Iraq. And we all know the election was supposed to solidify popular support for the Karzai government. Instead, it raised issues of fraud, threw a shadow over that government's legitimacy, which is still very strong today. That is the shadow. And Americans ask, why are we fighting and dying for a government that steals elections? Uh, it's produced a real negative impact. In Washington, the Afghanistan debate boils down to two major options. We all know them, counterinsurgency and counterterrorism. Counterinsurgency is supposed to be the big war option, aimed principally at fighting the Taliban. It encompasses the political strategy recommended by General McChrystal in that memo. And McChrystal says it would require at least 40,000 additional U.S. troops. The risk is that a big increase in American troops would provide more targets for the insurgents and bolster their resistance to what they perceive as foreign occupation. Most of the violence in Afghanistan has been directed at American forces and NATO forces. Counterterrorism, the other option, is supposed to be a small war option aimed principally at defeating and removing al-Qaeda. It would concentrate on military targets in the Afghan and Pakistani border areas. It would, we are told, require little or no change in U.S. troop levels. And by the way, the press has really centered on one issue, and one issue only in the debate over Afghanistan. It's the issue voters ask. It's the issue everyone in Washington asks. It's a number. How many new troops? How many? That's the only issue. That's what people want to know. That's what they're waiting to hear from the president. How many more troops are you going to send? The idea of counterterrorism is it would require little or no change in U.S. troop levels. The risk, of course, is that the Taliban might expand and eventually, their control rather, and eventually threaten the government in Kabul. I was asked by Derek and Jeff, what do the American people want to do? They asked me to talk about that. What do the polls show? And I looked at the polls, and I can give you the answer. They really don't know. They really don't have an idea. Uh, last month, CNN did a poll, and the public said they opposed sending more troops to Afghanistan, 59 to 39. That's a pretty solid margin. But then the Wall Street Journal and NBC News showed a closer split, 47% in favor of increasing troop levels in Afghanistan, 43% opposed. Uh, that was a little bit more support, because in September, 51% had been opposed. So it's, the polls are extremely confusing. That one, the journal NBC News poll, asked about all the major options in Afghanistan. Should we send 40,000 more troops to fight insurgents and protect the Afghan people? It was a split. 43% said yes, 49% said no. Should we withdraw nearly all U.S. troops and focus on attacking al-Qaeda camps using unmanned aircraft and commando teams? Americans were split, 45 to 43. Should we keep the same number of U.S. troops and focus on attacking al-Qaeda camps along the Pakistani border? These are all kinds of questions that Americans have no idea about. They shouldn't be asked. Uh, Americans, you know, the, there's a dirty little secret about polling. The secret is Americans think a poll is a quiz. And when you ask them a question like that, if you ever listened into a poll being administered, you ask them, should we keep the same no number of U.S. troops and focus on attacking al-Qaeda camps along the Pakistani border, the typical respondent will listen to the question and say, uh, yeah, that sounds okay, and then they'll add, was that the right answer? <laughs> they honestly think it's a quiz. Well, the answer to that question was a split, just like every other question, 46 to 43. What about sending 10,000 more troops to fight insurgents in some areas and to train Afghanistan's army and police? That's the middle way option. 
That got a little bit more public support, 55 to 36 percent in favor. What was interesting, I thought, in the poll was Americans don't see any difference between the Taliban and Al Qaeda. They put them in the same basket. Uh, Eighty percent said the U.S. should try to keep all elements of the Taliban out of power, even if some of them don't support terrorism against the United States. Americans were certain only about one thing. Security is a more important objective than nation building. They don't care about nation building. President Bush, or then Governor Bush, scoffed at it in his 2000 campaign. Uh, in the ABC News Washington Post poll, two-thirds said that preventing the establishment of al-Qaeda bases and keeping the Taliban out of power were extremely high priorities in Afghanistan. Only about a third gave high priority to establishing a stable dem democratic government in Afghanistan or promoting the economic development about Afghanistan. Those things people don't, uh, in Afghanistan, those things are not very high priorities. What's important is um, preventing the establishment of al-Qaeda bases and keeping the Taliban out of power. And the president seems to have gotten the message. He seems to be leaning towards a middle way, we are told by some of the leaks and reports that are aim that's aimed principally at security objectives. We cannot be seen as fighting in order to, pr to protect the government of Afghan President Hamid Karzai, because the, president, the credibility of that government has been too badly tainted by the election. It may not matter too much because the central government in Kabul really has so little control over the country. I spoke to the former sa staff director of the Senate Intelligence Committee who said, interestingly, that we Americans are more concerned with the credibility of the election than the Afghan people are. An American official told the Washington Post, most of Afghanistan that's stable is under local control. That may be why the Obama administration seems to be seeking local allies. Uh, the Obama strategy could involve a modest troop increase with a counterinsurgency strategy in the south where the Taliban has deep local roots and a counterterrorism approach in the north where the Taliban is much weaker. I asked the staff director on the Intelligence Committee what would victory in Afghanistan mean? Victory is an important word. You remember that uh, right after the 2006 election, President Bush came out with a document called Victory, the Path to Victory, because he knows that in American public opinion and American politics, the only thing that matters in any military effort is victory. So he was trying to define what victory meant in Iraq. It's still a bit unclear. Uh, I wanted to know what victory in Afghanistan would mean, because that's the only thing you can sell to the American electorate. He said, the marginalization of the terrorists so that they are reduced to ineffectual status. That's what victory means in Afghanistan. Now, that's going to require the full cooperation of Pakistan, because as we know, al-Qaeda and Taliban extremists operate out of bases in Pakistani territory. One important reason why the United States is fighting in Afghanistan is to keep the Pakistanis fighting on their side of the border. It's their war, we say, as well as our war. And that fight may not end, uh, may, th that is, they may not go on and fight unless we do. I look forward to finding out more from many of you who are more familiar with that region and that conflict uh, about the role of Pakistan in this. We may be fighting in large part as a demonstration effect to keep the Pakistanis on our side, to keep them fighting, because that's where the real war is. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to now go to all of you, and we're going to give the right of uh, what I call first response to Admiral William Fallon. Um, some of you may know that Admiral Fallon's last command as a four-star commander was Central Command. Central Command includes Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, so he is both a scholar and a warrior of this area. And Bill, why don't you give us both a response to what our panelists have said and any thoughts you want to have about uh, the issues we ought to be discussing today. And maybe you could pass the mic down, or do you want to come up? What's your preference? No, pass it down.
might be easier here. We'll see. Well, thanks, Derek. Mr. Ambassador, Mr. Schneider, um, it's, a, it's a treat to be here in this uh, distinguished audience. I recognize many, uh, many faces and uh, many backgrounds and a tremendous amount of knowledge. And I think the subject is very important to each of us as Americans and actually for the rest of the world. Um, I have a million things that I'd like to say, but I'm certainly not going to try to monopolize the time. A couple of comments that were made by uh, the ambassador and Bill um, struck uh, a chord with me. Uh, but I'd like to, uh, to back up and uh, to begin with uh, a couple of comments on uh, Nushin Abdabzada's uh, initial presentation on communications. Because the, the real issue here for me is communications. Uh, at the start and at the end, uh, that's the thing that's really the issue. Uh, that's what defines uh, victory, if you would, uh, success or failure, and it's our enduring challenge. Uh, in my experience, in any capacity, uh, the challenge of effective communication uh, either made or, made or, or caused to fail, uh, whatever the enterprise happened to be. And uh, in Afghanistan, in particular, uh, this is one of the most challenging environments that one could imagine. Uh, notwithstanding the, the uh, growth of television stations and the uh, advent of additional newspapers, in dealing with the real issue here, uh, and that happens to be, in my opinion, the people of Afghanistan, um, those two statistics are, are interesting but not particularly relevant in my view because outside of Kabul there is no television in this country uh, to speak of and it isn't just a matter of putting up stations and, and having people have the means to view them. Uh, the, the physics of the challenging uh, topography uh, makes it very, very challenging. I mean, it's just not in the realm of the possible anytime soon. Newspapers are interesting, but if two-thirds of the population can't read them, uh, what does it matter? Um, and the radio, which we thought was probably the next, uh, uh, the best bet here, again, a very, very uh, daunting challenge given the topography and the fact that most of the people live in these deep valleys and you just physically can't get the transmission signals into them. They're just the technical challenges. Um, how do you get the, this population to understand what's really going on? How do you try to shape their opinions uh, to achieve any measure of success? You might back up and say, um, what business of, it, of ours uh, to try to do this in the first place? Uh, who says that what we think or decide here uh, really matters? Uh, well, it certainly matters. Uh, but to the people over there, um, what they think and what they want to do, it seems to me, is really uh, the number one issue. Nonetheless, just the business of trying to communicate within that country with the population is as big a challenge as I've seen anywhere in the world. And, uh, and as we try to shape policies that might be effective in what I think would be a pretty generally accepted outcome, and that is uh, stability, or some measure of security for these people is a very, very uh, steep road uh, to climb. And so uh, if we talk about communications, uh, it seems to me we ought to have a pretty good understanding of uh, how we might accomplish that fact. Not with, you know, we could have the most uh, agile speaker, the most uh, influential and um, um, articulate uh, spokesperson for whatever the cause. But if you can't really get that message to the people, uh, you're starting out in a pretty good hole. Um, Ambassador raised uh, a lot of points that I think uh, really cover a tremendous amount of territory in this, uh, this particular part of the world. And rather than uh, go back and try to give you an opinion or, or a comment on those, um, I would just uh, make the comment that this illustrates for me, the complexity of trying to do something in this part of the world 
in understanding the issues and having enough knowledge to make, uh, to have an informed opinion. We can all have opinions, but whether they're based on fact, fiction, perception, or uh, just the uh, concern about am I smart or not smart on this topic, as, as Bill illustrated. Um, it seems that uh, uh, these are really interesting and challenging uh, things that we know little about. And we're not likely to know much more, unfortunately, uh, given the interest level of our people and the uh, difficulty of having uh, people deeply into this country and the issue of this country being Afghanistan and the issues to understand them well enough to communicate those in a manner that people might uh, be able to form opinions that, that are really based on, on some knowledge and fact. Uh, extremely challenging. Uh, we have a lot of politics at play here. Uh, politics domestically and politics around the rest of the world. Um, I would uh, maybe twist this thing a little different way and propose uh, some things for consideration uh, that I believe are pertinent to this discussion today and, uh, and maybe the larger issue of how do we come to grips with uh, a seemingly endless series of international engagements and challenges uh, that we seem to have little patience for. Uh, first, the issue of change. Uh, the point was made uh, by Bill Schneider that uh, there's a consideration that this is a new war. Okay, fair enough. Um, facts are, as he pointed out, that uh, this latest chapter, if you would, began in 2001, uh, some eight years ago. But the changes that have occurred since 2001 have been very, very significant. And the roles that we, the U.S., uh, have played as a country with our agents of engagement, be they military, civilian, diplomatic, economic, whatever, uh, have been uh, variously applied or not uh, in reaction to those changes and other interests and other drivers. But the fact is, change is a reality. And one of the challenges that we have in this business of communication and understanding and being able to have uh, judgments that are based on, on knowledge and fact the difficulty of keeping up with the changes. And so the situation today, vastly different than a year ago, five years ago, uh, back in 2001, exact same things that I saw in Iraq, for example. Um, the impact of change on the events. What might have been good in 2001 or two, uh, certainly in my opinion, isn't necessarily uh, appropriate today. And uh, two years ago when I was wrestling with some of these issues firsthand, uh, what appeared to be an appropriate solution, uh, I don't think necessarily is today for a lot of reasons that have little to do with me or the assets that I might have brought to bear, uh, but the involving situation and the background. Um, another consideration, the reality of politics. Uh, Bill Schneider made the comment that Americans hate political war. Um, interesting, and uh, I think there's a pretty strong basis for that feeling. But a couple of centuries ago, uh, Karl von Clausewitz uh, was pretty articulate in pointing out that war is in fact an extension of politics by other means. And so the idea that we can somehow isolate war from politics uh, I think is pretty preposterous. So what are we thinking about? Um, food for thought. Um, Politics is, a, is alive and well continuously in this country. And we often, I believe, uh, have our international decision making influenced to a phenomenal extent by domestic politics. And unfortunately, in my view, the domestic political view is often extremely short sighted or short term. And to be successful in the world of international politics and international engagement, my experience, requires a long-term investment. And it gets into any number of things. Now, why is it that we seem to be able to find the resources to spend billions and billions of dollars uh, digging ourselves out of challenging situations in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in other places, when uh, we have ample experience that 
a fraction of that investment in advance to try to solve the security and stability issues all over the world would have such a huge return on that investment. It's really mystifying to me that people will, as Bill indicated in this polling uh, business, uh, will state a preference for uh, doing this or doing that, but there's very little inclination to get engaged and make the investments that in the long term would be so beneficial to so many people. What are we thinking about? There's a more than rhetorical question, but this is a reality. Um, in this specific situation of Pakistan, it was pretty clear to me as an observer and a citizen of this country that the plan a year ago for the incoming administration was to get out of Iraq, the bad war, and get into Afghanistan. Uh, I was asked several times for my opinion on that topic, and I said, that's an interesting proposition, and in the baseball world, that'll get you two strikes real quickly. Why? As has been pointed out, Iraq kind of went over the hill and receded, certainly from most public interest or view, about a year and a half ago. And we're on a track that um, most of our people will be out of there, I think, pretty soon. Afghanistan, in my opinion and experience, is not a place that lends itself to, we're here to help, we'll send whatever it takes, here comes the Army and the Marine Corps, and we're going to take care of the situation. There's ample evidence that indicates we better be very, very careful about how we in introduce military force into this particular area. And I think that's part of, as an aside, what's really going on. I think that realization has really hit home in, down inside the Beltway, and people are having a much more considered look at what we're really about to do or could do. But that was a political plan uh, based on domestic considerations in gathering support for an election, in my opinion. Agendas, another major consideration. There are agendas afoot constantly. So I get things done. People that are seized with, uh, with uh, an idea, uh, that are dedicated to uh, moving some issue or some idea forward, um, take this idea and they try to get it in front of the president, the other leadership in the country, and they push constantly. And so if you couldn't envision yourself in the shoes of the president, um, he has uh, hundreds if not thousands of agents nearby pushing agendas. Many of them end up coming to rest somewhere in this issue of Afghanistan, whether it's Afghanistan directly, an interest in the people, in the women, in their health, in their education, their housing, their security, you name it. Others who could care less, have no interest whatsoever, but might use this issue to further their agendas domestically or otherwise. The reality is it's, I think, wise for us to understand that these agendas are afoot constantly. And not only do they play in the decision making, they play in taking away from the deciders the opportunity to give often the time and attention it really requires to get it right. Trying to wrestle with these constant issues, um, some cloaked in the proposed issue today, Afghanistan, others not, is extremely demanding and I think debilitating in many ways because of the energy that sucks away from trying to focus on the real issue. The capacity of the U.S. population, both for understanding these issues and uh, related to that, the patience for implementing any policies is suspect, in my opinion. You've heard a similar opinion from Bill. Um, Ambassador certainly pointed out uh, challenges in this regard. And so it's kind of an uphill fight on the one hand, the population seems to be, well, just get it right, figure it out, and go do it. The problem is the go do it and get it right and get it to be successful, whether you define it as a victory or um, a little less all-encompassing but maybe more meaningful security or way ahead that might be better for these people, um, doesn't matter. It's going to take anything. It's going to take time. It's not going to happen anytime soon. And the very idea that we think it could seems to me uh, pretty preposterous. 
So why do we continue to kind of push in the, those directions? We have little patience. Just recognize, okay? Some things you can fix. Some things you just got to figure out how, to, how you're going to work with. Uh, it seems to me that's one of them. Uh, facts, opinions, and perceptions. Uh, people are fond of saying that they believe in facts. They want data. Uh, I was uh, taught a pretty uh, good lesson some years back. Uh, in Washington, I was in front of a congressional committee, and uh, someone was testifying uh, on an issue, and they trundled in front of this committee a barrage of uh, information that I uh, absolutely gagged upon hearing, because in my mind, it was not only not factual, it was made up uh, nonsense and bore little resemblance to the vision that I had of this specific issue. So I sat there and allowed my teeth to grind a bit. When it came time to speak, I said, Mr. Chairman, um, in my business, I deal in facts. And I really haven't heard many here. And I got about three more words out of my mouth before the chairman came across the green table and just about choked me and said, Admiral, you better learn something, buddy. Up here, we deal in perceptions. And whatever you think of the facts doesn't matter. The perception is, and then I got a 10-minute harangue. So, you know, dutifully chastened, I eased back down on my seat and said, that was a great opening, Fallon. What do you do for your second act here? <laughs> but, but I got the point. And uh, I've been a little, tried to be a little more careful uh, since then about uh, understanding that uh, perception, particularly in politics, is critical. And if politics is really so intricately uh, connected to this war, it really is an important issue. Uh, but it's something that we have to deal with. Opinion is pretty fickle. Um, I don't particularly care much for polls either because I think polls are very reflective of yesterday's situation. Um, what did I hear last? Okay, it sounds good to me, whatever it is. Uh, I certainly have strong opinions. My mother-in-law had strong opinions around our house. We used to uh, be very careful to uh, make sure that her opinions were respected, at least uh, in front of her. Uh, but uh, <laughs> some of them struck us as a little bit, uh, God bless her, off the, off the subject often and whatever. But, uh, hey, we all recognize everyone's entitled to opinions. But what are they based upon? Is there any figment of fact here, or are we... Uh, just going on wishful thinking or we whatever. But these are considerations we have to deal with in addressing any of these issues. Um, I think the last thing that I would point out in this regard is the uh, business of outside interests. Um, in Afghanistan, the country, um, there are many interests uh, that are not U.S. interests. In the region, there are many interests and in actors. In fact, all over the world, there are people that have things that can be brought to bear in Afghanistan uh, that have huge influence and pretend, uh, potential impact on anything that we might want to do. And uh, we can't necessarily do much about some of these interests, but it is, I think, the wise person that would consider these interests and uh, factor them into decisions that we want to make. And as we approach these challenges, to recognize that there are lots of people uh, that want to have a say in this thing. And uh, all of these things uh, tend to make things pretty complex. Um, so why don't I end it there? Do you want to do some general questioning? Yeah. All yeah, right. Sit down. Happy to sit down. You can see the Admiral's also a bit of a diplomat, and I hope you all press him a little more. The one question I'm dying to ask him, and I'm not now, I hope some of you will, is uh, how the military feels about the press. Um, so you may want to take your time at some point and ask him about some of those questions, because I didn't mention that uh, Admiral Fallon was also brought to a slightly quicker retirement than he had anticipated by a story in the press. So uh, the press is part of the political landscape. Uh, we have lots of time for comments, questions, start the discussion. We're not trying to resolve anything uh, today other than uh, the, the rules here, Michael, you, no hand raising, you put up your little sign and David Fisher, Capital Group, has his sign up first, so I'm going to let David throw out the first. If you can pass the microphone over so we can catch it. I think they, I believe they'll be heard. 
but but we need oh, you for the record, dude. Oh, okay. So we can remind you later, David, that what you said. Um, one question of the Admiral and the Ambassador, and that is, if you were the President and were making the decision now, what would you do? And a question of all three of you, what do you think the President will do? Well, they, they also can decline to answer those particular <laughs> questions, but if any of them would like to say, answer either one, or you can just let it go. Say the Admiral first, I'll follow you. <laughs> Must be aged before beauty. Right. Um, the President's going to have to make a decision, and, and uh, a series of decisions, I suspect, here, and it's, it's really his, and who am I to uh, try to tell him what to do, which I, I won't try, but I would, uh, I would say that uh, my sense of what's happening now is um, a recognition that it's a lot more complex than some may have thought it was uh, back uh, eight, nine months ago. And it's going to, and uh, the more thought uh, that can be brought to bear based on, uh, on facts and information, um, probably the better off we're going to be. Now, um, I also will tell you in a, at a more tactical level that I think that uh, the idea that we do one thing or another, that we do counterterrorism or counterinsurgency or we you know, pick an extreme, the, one of the challenges for the media is to keep away from this white or black that's going to be war or peace or love or hate or something, which is pretty nonsensical. The world is much more nuanced. So I think that in Afghanistan, uh, we're going to need uh, to, to be successful in several different approaches, uh, and they're going to be based, or should be considered anyway, uh, based on the situation in different parts of the country. There are parts of this, this country that are pretty stable, that are pretty quiet. Mm -hmm. And uh, someone made the comment earlier that uh, local governance is a big deal. It is the big deal, in my opinion. And uh, I think, back to the one of my feelings <clears throat> that you better be really careful about how much force you bring where. Most of this country is rural. Um, the people live in villages and towns in isolated mountain valleys that have little connection to Kabul and uh, little experience uh, or taste or knowledge of central government rule. What they know is what they've known for centuries, and it's all local. And so the, business, the idea that we uh, come down with some universal policy uh, that we stamp over top of Kabul and say, carry this out, boys and girls, uh, it seems to be pretty ludicrous. So local conditions should influence actions, it seems to me, is, the, is a good general rule. And then uh, you'd have a lot of other things. Uh, the issue of Afghan security, remember, another fundamental tenet of potential success here. This is about the Afghan people, more importantly than us. And they're going to have to decide at the end of the day what they want. We can wish for anything. We can send 300,000 troops or try to. Not that they were available. Now, we could do all kinds of things. It doesn't matter too much if they decide they want to do something different. So the question of, you know, why is it that we can't seem to do something with this image of a ragtag uh, local militia type army? Um, this is their country, their territory, their ideas, their customs, and uh, we have to be really careful. A lot of people want change in this country. Most people do not like the Taliban, any way, shape, or form. They've seen it. You have a cadre of people around Kandahar, maybe think they're great. Most people absolutely don't want a repetition of this. So they're not really supporting the Taliban. They are supporting, in my opinion, grievances, issues, age-old enmities. There's an awful lot of this. So it really ought to drive us against one universal Let's do this and make it stick and uh, have a much more nuanced approach, it seems to me. Mort, do you want to weigh in? <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, frankly, it's obviously a hellish problem. And uh, uh, I have thought about this, as many others have, a long time. And uh, I am not really confident as to what to do. But a few things strike me as very important. 
One thing is how long are we prepared to stay in Afghanistan to establish, help them establish some sort of reasonably stable government? Everybody refuses, as I pointed out from my conversation with a senior official, everybody refuses to answer that question. Now, there is no magic elixir to resolve this problem. It's going to take a long time. And parenthetically, one of the things that most impressed me is we have fought two, year, two wars for almost eight years. When Colin Powell said we could never fight a long war. And we had to have exit strategies. We have no exit strategies. And why can we fight so long? For eight years, it's very simple, in my view. There's no draft. And we have a professional army. And that means, for good or for will, and we, we have to be aware of all the pressures we put on a professional military establishment uh, to, to keep it going. That means we have a greater leeway for a longer term policy. But that then runs into domestic politics. And my attitude is that the, if the president can explain it, where he's going and is willing to, 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 to make clear his determination, the public, Bill may disagree with me, you know, he's much knowledge, more knowledgeable than I, the public will stand for it. Uh, and uh, so base, but that doesn't answer your question. My own view is that uh, we sh that given the uncertainties of the politics that we should uh, go to a system of, of trying to protect all the major policy centers, uh, add a certain amount of, of, of uh, troops to protect it, and try to deal with the rest of the country, uh, try to build up the Afghan forces. I still don't have an answer as to why Afghan forces take so long to build up, to build up Afghan forces and to deal with the Taliban in the, where they're the strongest in, in, in the five provinces of uh, the south by, uh, by constant uh, air and uh, other means. Uh, it's not a great policy, but I think it's a more defensible policy uh, in terms of political considerations. I, I sort of believe that that's where the president is going. He's going to not take you know, not, and it's very unfortunate, this whole thing, and the press, Bill made the point. The whole press is focused on one issue, 20,000, 20, 40,000. That seems to me a ridiculous issue, simply. The question is, what do we do? Where are we going? And now we, we're based on 20,000 or 40,000. I think probably he's going to choose 20,000 and, and cut it both ways. And I sort of think he'll move in the direction I vindicate, but I have no idea. Yeah, but that's sort of where I am right now. Okay. Um, Mike Metavoy, and then. Well, Bill doesn't want to be president. He's the press. No, he said the question of the forecast. Oh, well, well, look, who knows? Nobody, everyone in Washington thinks they know. Nobody really knows anything. Okay. Well, uh, doesn't stop them from no, saying no. things. No, they say a lot of things. I, I think this is a president, uh, unlike President Bush, this president does nuance. Right. Bush famously did not do nuance. Uh, he's constantly seeking the middle way. I think that's what he's doing here. Uh, he certainly learned that we cannot be fighting a war to protect the government of Hamid Karzai. That ain't going to fly. Uh, and he's looking for options that are more localized, as the ambassador, uh, the, the, general, the admiral just said. Uh, he's looking for a more complex approach, which will adapt to local circumstances, rely more on local leaders, local militias, because there is no real country. I don't think, now you may disagree, I don't think there's any country there. Uh, there is a capital city and a government that proposes to rule, but the idea that we're fighting for that government is just not going to work. Uh, the problem is the press doesn't buy nuance. Uh, they don't want it, they don't want to buy it, they just want to know one thing. How many? How many are you going to send? That's the only issue for the press. All right, we'll go back and forth between the tables. Peter Galbraith on this table, and then we'll go back to Mike Metaphor. Well, Use the mic, would you, I'm Peter? Sorry. It's right there. The 
thank, thank you. And uh, of course, uh, I guess Admiral Fallon, you and I have something in common of having a premature retirement due to a newspaper <laughs> story. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I wanted to comment on a, a, a couple of things. Um, first, uh, uh, Bill, and something you said about uh, what the Afghan people, how they feel about those elections. And of course, you're, you're completely right in the sense that most people don't care. Hey, in December of 2000, most Americans didn't necessarily care either. They just wanted the thing over. But the people who do care, care a lot. And they end up being very important. So I, 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 it's not probably sufficient to say most Afghans don't care because the ones who care really care. Uh, uh, a second uh, point is that, of course, the public opinion may, may well be where it matters the most is, is also the point that you're making, which is, uh, uh, yes, the elections have undermined Karzai's legitimacy, but sure as hell changed the perception of the Afghanistan war from fighting al-Qaeda to fighting now for a corrupt, fraudulent uh, regime. And that's, that's certainly made it much, more, much harder. Um, the issue of, uh, you know, more on this issue of, of, of the Afghan forces, why is it so difficult? Uh, I mean, I, I, that's a long uh, conversation. But, Do it quickly. But, it's, <laughs> but, but look, look also at, at Iraq. You compared how well the Peshmerga could operate uh, as to how utterly inefficient for such a long time the Iraqi army was. Uh, and I would argue that partly it's because we seek to create these armies in our own image. And in fact, we seek That's to create the government That's what I'm saying. in our own image. Uh, and that, that takes a long time and it doesn't necessarily work. Um, but it comes to another point, which I would go to the press in my last point. Which is, we, we, also, we also really miss the question, who are they? Who are the people that we're dealing with in Iraq? Both the American officials of the day and the press until for a long time kept talking about Iraqis. You know, they didn't talk about Shiites, Sunnis, and Kurds who, of course, didn't want to be Iraqi at all. Didn't think of themselves as Iraqi. And Af Afghanistan, we, we keep talking about the Afghan people. Uh, yes, I mean, there is a greater sense of national identity, but, but do we have a lot of reporting on Tajiks, Hazaras, Uzbeks? Hey. One reason the Taliban has a limited reach is that it, it, there are no Taliban that go beyond the Pashtun population. So, uh, but, but this is totally missed from the reporting, and as a result, it's hugely missed from the, from the public dialogue in this country about the issue. And, and therefore, in what I would argue, and I'll talk about tomorrow, the most important feature of Afghanistan isn't really part of the debate. Moore, do you want a yeah. quick response? As it wasn't of Iraq. I, uh, let me uh, just briefly go to this question of Afghan forces. Uh, back in 89, the CIA in its wisdom made extraordinary errors, including our present Secretary of Defense, about the situation in Afghanistan. Uh, and one of them was the statement that once the Russians left, the forces of Najibullah, Najibullah would be finished in a very short period of time. That was the concerted view of the intelligence community other than the State Department. I say that because I was around. And the fact is that Najibullah, with his own forces, lasted four years. And he couldn't be defeated until some of his forces betrayed him. And so the notion that we have a good feel for how to make Afghan forces viable, I remain a permanent skeptic. They have fought a lot, and I cannot understand why we can't, they cannot be brought together to fight among the peoples that you have mentioned. I'm not going to let you respond right know, now, Peter. I really want to come back to that because, of course, the important point is that Najibullah lasted longer than the Soviet Union. <laughs> uh, and I brought General Rodriguez, the, the, the number two there, to have, to, to have dinner with the a Russian ambassador who had been all there all through the 80s. 
And he said, oh, you, you, uh, you've come to want to learn about our mistakes. I think that's ridiculous. I said, no, no. I would come to want to learn about your success. Mike? Use the, use the mic, please. Mort, I just want to talk to you about the frustration you have about the media. You know, if, if media is the message, <clears throat> which I'm not so sure it is anymore, you know, we're undergoing a enormous change in the media. We are now in the 21st century, something that, um, <clears throat> you know, we're, we're not really nascent to, quite frankly. I'm certainly not, anyway. And it's going to require a different definition and a different look at what the media does. I mean, for all intents and purposes, you know, it's a business, which, and it, it basically all the reporters are going to disappear as a result of the things that, that are going on. Basically, it's a cloudy and murky view. So I'm not so sure that you're going to get your desire, which is to get the media really to, to have some, you know, some definition of what's going on. And, and one more issue, which is the, the issue of, you know, there's all this question about whether the president's dithering or not in the media, or whether it's dithering or he's not, you know, make, making up his mind. And I've gotten calls from various friends who, in places where, you know, they, they should know better. And they're, they're, you know, they're all saying, well, the president ought to make a decision. Well, nobody's going out there and really saying decisively, you know, it requires real thought to make a decision, to make this decision. You know, we're ready to take on, you know, another Vietnam and see all these bodies come back. Anyway, that's it. Okay, we're going to go over this table. Kathy. Thank you. Um, Kathy Spiller, uh, Feminist Majority Foundation and Ms. Magazine. I'm delighted to have been asked to participate. Um, thank you. Um, just several thoughts, uh, having listened now um, to a number of the presentations. Uh, I do think, with a few notable exceptions, some of whom are in the room, that the press has largely ignored the complexity of the situation in Afghanistan confronting the United States or that region. And part of it has been, uh, historically, the press has ignored um, uh, the role the U.S. has played over 30, 40 years um, in the region including the funding of um, the so-called freedom fighters um, to oppose the Soviets. And from that crowd that we armed and funded um, to see these different factions emerge, and, and one of them, the Taliban, um, to, uh, we've ignored uh, largely in, in terms of this discussion the role that Pakistan has played and the role of the U.S. relationships with Pakistan in uh, funding um, and orchestrating uh, much of the uh, the Taliban, um, and you know we can and thank goodness that President Obama has taken this uh, broader view of the region and the situation, and is taking into account our relationship with Pakistan. Um, we've also, I mean, to to pose the question is how many more troops or no troops or withdrawal is oversimplified. I think it it doesn't uh, give any credit to the American public's ability to understand uh, these issues. And uh, you can't really talk about, given what our role was there historically, uh, you can't really talk about where we go from here without talking about more than a military uh, uh, solution. I mean, there is no military solution. You've got to talk about uh, economic development and other kinds of uh, uh, assistance to rebuilding a state that, frankly, the U.S. helped destroy. Uh, it is not a 14th century culture only. I mean, that is the way the country is being portrayed. It simply is not true. Um, and um, a, a major failure after uh, 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 2001 was that the opportunity we had to see uh, Afghans come from all over the world back to help rebuild their country, we, we helped short circuit that because of uh, our uh, move away immediately to Iraq. Um, and. Um, uh, you've got to talk about um, helping rebuild a state uh, if we're going to have any long-term stability. You have to have civil society. It cannot just be uh, a military uh, solution. And women's human rights are a key part of that. We know that. Um, and girls and women's education. So uh, that has to be taken into account. Um, and finally, uh, uh, second to last point, no one's even mentioned the role of the oil interests 
or the role of um, our uh, government over the years and uh, uh, our purpose for being there often is the oil interest um, and, and without dealing with that, um, uh, you can't really talk about a larger solution. And finally, um, uh, what I understand, what we've heard about uh, the military and why it takes so darn long to rebuild uh, a, an army is uh, we're paying so little. Uh, it's uh, the uh, average salary, it's our understanding of an Afghan soldier is $150 a month. Now, even in Afghanistan, you can hardly live on that, and the Taliban's willing to pay $300 a month. So it's a matter of economic survival. Uh, and if we put more, uh, if we did something different um, in our military training there, maybe we could see a different outcome. Um, but as you say, the Taliban is only supported by about 4% of the population. So why is it they're able to recruit? They pay. Uh, and people have to live. Um, so it's a very complex situation. And um, I think the press has got to take a larger view and take the time to explore these issues so that people can make informed decisions and certainly that uh, public opinion can be informed. Thanks, Kathy. Mickey Kanner? Yeah, just Could you use the mic too, Mickey? Just to see. Find out. <laughs> Uh, just a, in talking about the inadequacy of the press and what they have covered and what they haven't, and this is a broader comment because some in the press have covered this, our national security interest, whatever it is, really takes short shrift. It's very interesting. Again, back to what Bill Schneider talked about, 20,000, 40,000, whatever, 12,000, whatever. That's really not the question. Uh, when it, you know, do we want to protect the women of Af Afghanistan and is that a national security interest of the United States? Well, it may be and it may not be, but we need to discuss that. You don't, you know, uh, we sh maybe we should be in the Congo or the Sudan if we want to really protect women and want to protect that, that national security interest. I'm not making light of it. What I'm saying is that we don't talk about these, these very big issues that are so tough to define. We thought it was in the national security interest in Vietnam for the domino theory. Well, there was no domino uh, effect. Uh, we thought in Iraq it was weapons of mass destruction, and there were no weapons of mass destruction. And so now we look at is are we protecting uh, against uh, uh, a, a uh, Pakistan falling apart? Is that why we're there? Are we protecting the U.S. homeland against uh, uh, a terrorism? Uh, how does then the role of the Afghan population, our relation to them, make a difference there. I would submit the Afghan population makes no difference to us whatsoever unless we have a broader national security interest in being there in the first place. And so it seems to me the press has totally dropped the ball in that one. I'd like to hear some comments about that. Okay. Well, maybe we'll take a couple more questions and then come back to the panel. Diane Amons. Yeah. Uh, my name is Diane Amons. Use, use the mic again, Diane. Otherwise. My name is Diane Amon. I am the director of the California International Law Center at the University of California Davis Law School, uh, where I'm a professor of law. My area of expertise is international humanitarian law, and so I've been quite interested in all of the comments, but uh, was particularly inspired by uh, Ambassador Abramowitz's, and I wanted to make some comments and questions about that. From the perspective of international humanitarian law, the issue is civilian collateral damage. And I thought you spoke um, quite eloquently about that. And for me, for years now, the huge question mark in both of these military conflicts, and I would add, excuse me, I would add Pakistan, which I see as a low intensity conflict at this point. Um, the reportage about civilian casualties has been almost non-existent. There is a website that purports to tell us numbers of Iraqi casualties. Um, it's not reported very much anymore. It was initially, I can tell you now, it's up to over 100,000 persons killed um, since the invasion. There is, as far as I know, no source whatsoever for accurate counts on civilian casualties in Afghanistan. What we get from the media are anecdotal reports of the tragedy at the wedding party. And that's very easy to isolate. 
uh, to, to treat as an aberration. Um, it's always accompanied with the, well, we were sure that the males were combatants uh, explanation. Um, I understand the difficulties of guerrilla warfare, but it seems to me this is an area where the media could do an incredible amount of work um, to help us understand the conflict, not just from the perspective of the uh, 5,000 or so American service members and other coalition members who have been killed, but all the people who are caught up in the conflict. Um, it's an issue of prevention, which I've heard from a number of people. Sometimes we used to talk about nation building. I think the word that's coming in my field now is prevention. Even Admiral Fallon said if we just spent a little bit at the front end, we wouldn't have these costs at the back end. And um, I guess to sum it up, what I heard you say at the very end is maybe we need another sort of watchdog. And I would uh, like to ask you what, what you were thinking when you made that comment at the end. Thank you. Thanks. Did you want to respond? Uh, and, and let me just add parenthetically, these are not sadly new issues. Um, that same year I visited Afghanistan, I was then in a private meeting outside of Boston with Henry Kissinger and a young man who nobody had heard of at the time, Daniel Ellsberg, stood up and asked Kissinger for an estimate of Vietnamese and other South Asian casualties in Southeast Asia in the war. And Kissinger said, well, we have, we have, we don't collect that data and, and uh, it's not relevant. So this is not new. Mort? Uh, you raised, as I have myself, an, an extremely difficult issue. And it is, there's a real uh, problem, in, and, uh, which is, is how do you get the bad guys? And we have limited ways of getting the bad guys. And one of them is through drones. Problem with drones, of course, is, is this. And Peter Bergen has done, I don't know how good is a study of civilian casualties on drones versus uh, and the problem with drones is there's no question there's a lot of collateral damage. But it is, it is right now uh, not covered by the press by and large, except for a few people in the press. And by the way, I, one of the people here who I think has done terrific reporting is, is Roy Gutman and him, the McClatchy people I think have done exceedingly well. And any negative remarks I made do not, do not apply to them. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know that you can make any progress on this issue, quite frankly. I do think it's important to raise it. I think it's a mistake for the president to raise it. And the only other source of trying to, to bring this to greater attention are the NGOs and, and the blogs. They're the only sources of bringing attention. May I take a minute for another thing? Another issue which I am very, very sensitive about, if you'll excuse me. Back in 1995 to 99, there was no such thing as the Taliban. Nobody ever heard of the Taliban. And very few people heard of, 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 of Osama bin Laden. And I take great umbrage, quite frankly, people reading a 2009 situation into a 1985 situation. We were not smart enough to know what was going to happen in, 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 in uh, Afghanistan. But I personally believe that removing the Soviets was a very good thing, and I still believe it's a good thing. And I think it had extraordinary consequences. And so I just want to, I might feel a little self-defense. No, no, more, nobody minds if you were a gun runner. It's all right. <laughs> It was the Cold War. It but, was the Cold War. I you don't have to defend but I, yourself. But I wanted to. But okay. <laughs> uh, let me go to Bob Shear and then Jonathan Taplin. Yeah, well, first of all, <clears throat> give Bob a mic. Yeah, you know, I actually, I, I feel very uncomfortable in these kind of meetings because I feel we're kind of a, a special interest that sort of wants these wars to continue so we'll have something to talk about. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, Bob, that's it's, it's, a personal uh, response well, on your part. But I, I, you know, and, I, and the reason I'm saying that is when you say no one knew, 
Now, Kathy Spiller, for instance, who, who, with the feminist majority, was actually the main organization calling attention to what the Taliban was doing, but before the Taliban, what was happening, and, and what the condition was. And, and the big policy makers and experts didn't give a damn, frankly, because there were larger policy considerations. And I remember in the years leading up to 9-11, the only organization that I really knew of around here, certainly, but I think nationally, was her organization. They weren't experts. They didn't get the credibility. Uh, they weren't treated seriously. That's, that's number one. Secondly, this utter nonsense that suggests that we made the world safer uh, by going into Afghanistan. Uh, I mean, it's just, just a denial of everything we've seen since then. Or the idea of recruiting these maniacs from all over the world to be the Arab freedom fighters and celebrate them and not take responsibility for what they do after. And then the casual discussion here is if the Taliban which are clearly a locally rooted phenomena, and the identification with the Taliban with al-Qaeda, uh, I think is nonsensical. Your own national security advisor to Obama has said there's fewer than 100 right now in Afghanistan. They're incapable of mounting attacks. And everything we know about al-Qaeda, we know they can be just as happy in Hamburg or San Diego or Orlando functioning. They don't need Afghanistan. So the assumption that's being made here that somehow we have to get more troops and get in there to deny them a haven when clearly they can find havens in lots of places of the world. But I want to make a larger point because I keep hearing this reference to the media. And uh, you know, one of the reasons our founders warned against these imperial adventures was they didn't think they were compatible with democracy. And of course you can't have an informed public. And most of our experts in foreign policy matters have lied to us. They withhold the basic information. For God's sake, I was there in Vietnam at the time of the Gulf of Tonkin where I didn't learn about it until 20 years later when the people in government decided to release some documents. And it turned out they knew at the time that they were lying about the certainty of the attack and so forth. Uh, you say that we didn't know about, Kissinger didn't know about casualties. Well, Robert McNamara certainly figured it out. He came out with the 3.4 million dead in Indochina in a war he couldn't defend, but he didn't tell us about it until, um, you know, some 40 years later or so forth. So I think that this idea to expect a press, uh, even in its, certainly in its weakened state, but even in the heyday, to actually be able to cover these events when they are concealed by national security, when jingoism and patriotism dominates, and you can always whip up a frenzy, you can always intimidate the reporters, and if not the reporters, certainly the people who control the media, I think it's folly to suggest uh, that you can go down this course. And I think you should address the question of whether you can have a democratic society and have an informed public and meaningful debate if you're going to keep making these foreign adventures, stoking the fears, uh, getting people hysterical, exaggerated responses, and so forth. I think that's the big issue. Okay. And also, uh, what I remind everyone that we're going to have the press panel next. The press is going to have a really good opportunity to defend themselves <laughs> and to address Bob's question and others. Jonathan? Okay. So... I have an actual question as opposed to a statement. <laughs> but you're allowed, this and, is a, and, and we're allowed to make statements. It, it's actually posed to Bill Schneider. Uh, Ambassador laid out a history of the press's willingness to back three major wars and then turn around. In other words, they were cheerleaders for Vietnam. Your network was go, go into Iraq. I remember seeing the in embedded reporters just cheering us on. And now, you know, McChrystal and Petraeus leaked the, the report to Bob Woodward so they can position the president in their own way. And so we got a, a new cheerleading. So Peter Galbraith's father coined a phrase called the conventional wisdom in the 50s. Why is it that the press is constantly trapped by the conventional wisdom and cannot think for themselves at all. I'm going to leave that as a question for the next panel, Jonathan, because that's so provocative that we want professional members of the press to respond. Is Bill a member of the press? Well, no. Bill, I'm not, Bill is a political scientist and an expert. And I, let's go to the State Department for a minute. Jeremy Curtin. I also will say by disclosure that Jeremy was my public affairs officer when I was ambassador in Helsinki, and he's risen since then. Well, Derek taught me everything I know, but I'd like to ask uh, what for me as a, com a communication person in the State Department is an operational question. 
It goes to Admiral Fallon's comment about how tough it is in Afghanistan to communicate to the Afghan peoples. The question then comes to me is, if it's so hard, is it impossible? And then is communication strategy part of our overall strategy, or do, does it become so difficult it's, it's irrelevant? Uh, is it possible? Yeah. Uh, I think so. I think uh, Mike cut when I was there was radio was probably our best bet. And it's not uh, like the people don't care, they don't want to hear. They're, uh, they're very, very anxious, in my experience, to want to know more about what's going on. Uh, given a choice between continuing to do things the way that they had done and make change, for example, in schools, giving the younger people an opportunity to get educated, they overwhelmingly vote in favor of uh, giving the kids a chance. And they'll go to, in my experience, extraordinary lengths to try to make that happen. So. I think there's a there's a receptivity there uh, as word gets around, but it requires a, an awful lot of effort. I could just follow on that. Part of the common wisdom is that the Taliban or the uh, our opposing forces are out communicating us mm -hmm. in Afghanistan, as Holbrook said they were before. Do you think that's true? Uh, I think there um, and there are all kinds of statements that have been made here. Uh, but to me, illustrate the challenge we face. Uh, I've heard some things said today that I think are absolutely spot on, some others that are so ridiculous that I think they're not even in the realm of, of close to reality. And that's the, rea that's the reality because of these perceptions and, and a mess of opinions. Um, I think that um, communication is really critical. Um, the extremists of the world, and there are connections, there, I don't know how many... Um, Al-Qaeda there are, if anybody could even begin to guess. I suspect the number is a lot smaller than, than some might think, but the fact is that uh, people who undertake uh, activities uh, and share common objectives and common means have gone to school on this, and they recognize that the key to success, one of the major keys to success is communication. And it's sometimes easier for a smaller group to do this than a larger group in my experience. So they've taken advantage of the fact that um, who knows how they do this. In Iraq, we know a lot more than we, uh, than we did early on, and we found that the extremists were exceedingly effective at intercommunication to get their messages, the key messages understood and get out. So some of this is being used against us. I used to be very, very frustrated at statements that it would appear in the media um, alleging whatever. Uh, with no basis in fact that I could see, um, and they were very cleverly done, often without bylines, not attributed to an individual, sometimes to individuals that turns out didn't exist, but they could effectively begin to sway opinion. So it's, it's a major, any uh, chance for success in this arena um, has to involve uh, a very, very strong communications plan and the willingness to be able to adapt it very quickly on the fly uh, as events change. And I think you know, back to your, your experience, and uh, it's probably one of the most important things. You know, we focus on military, on numbers of soldiers, and again, this business of numbers, that doesn't mean a whole lot to me at all. What they do and how they do it's really important. But of all the things that you could really have on your side, if you had an understanding of uh, how to effectively communicate and have the key ideas to get across, it's, it's really much higher on the list than many other tools that we try to bring to bear. Well, this is supposedly a great attribute of our president, but we will see. Richard, Walden. Thanks, Derek. I'm Richard Walden. I run an NGO called Operation USA, which is 30 years old and started in Indochina when Mort was ambassador to Thailand and used to regularly get in fights with Mort. Okay. No, uh, no advertisements for groups. Well, coming, out of Viet coming out of Vietnam and having him threaten me with a Logan Act prosecution for talking to the foreign minister about policy. The, it seems to me that going back to the purpose of the conference, which is the media coverage, the me I think we refuse government money from AID because we don't want to be part of what Colin Powell said the combat team. He once famously said, I love NGOs, you're part of the combat team, and the 400 people in the room all groaned. The, the NGO community has been 
largely bought off by massive government grants with high overheads. And they, they become an adjunct of US foreign policy. The media, who used to be our partner, where we were invincible in the field. Nobody would shoot at us, nobody would take us hostage. We could go anywhere we wanted in Indochina and other parts of East Africa. When the media be allowed themselves to become embedded, and I know they did it in World War II, I get that there were war, war reporters way back when. When they told the story of the Iraq War and Afghanistan as an adventure story, which is what a lot of the reports looked like to me, at least on television. I thought we were in deep trouble. It was one thing, if the NGOs are being bought off by gigantic government grants that they rake 20% off of, and the media are allowed access. And the access is manipulated. I think Admiral Fallon was onto something, but I think you're sh selling short how effective the Rumsfeld Pentagon and others were in offering people that to be in the first unit punching across the border into Iraq. And then, of course, the American public gets manipulated by a story like that and winds up supporting uh, a conflict that should be insupportable. OK, Carol, did you still want your sign to be up? Pass the mic to Carol Williams. Carol Williams with the Los Angeles Times. I was a foreign correspondent for 25 years, and some of my assignments included both Soviet-occupied Afghanistan and the U.S. invasion um, post 9-11. My question is, from what you understand of Afghan public opinion, do you think there's significantly better regard for the presence of U.S. troops and the objectives of Washington, as expressed through Hamid Karzai, who at least initially was Washington's choice, than there was during the Soviet occupation for Moscow's presence and the installation of Babra Kamal and Najibullah as the ideological spearheads for the communist bloc. Does anybody want to? I don't know anything about Afghan public opinion. I'm not sure there is. I don't know that there is such a thing. I mean, there probably is, but, but it's, it's, you know, it, it, there's polling, but I'm, I don't know that I would trust it. My, from my impressions from people who have been there is they don't like foreigners. And that includes people of different ethnic groups as well. I mean, uh, there's the, the idea of foreigners, foreign occupation, foreign troops, that probably goes back to Alexander the Great. Uh, but uh, the resentment of foreigners, that's virtually universal. But certainly in a country like Afghanistan, Soviets, Americans, probably the same. Yeah. Nershim, do you have any uh, facts on this matter? I know there's polls done, but I'm... get exact information is nearly impossible. That's absolutely true. But I do definitely object to this presentation of Afghanistan at this, at this uh, almost like a Martian place where humans are so extraordinary and difficult and hard to uh, communicate with. Af in, in reality, those who have interacted with Afghans would find out that we share information readily. It's very easy to communicate and to connect with each other, you know, like you, you, you very quickly make friends with people and they share information. What I have noticed is um, a lack of um, interest in actually wanting to get to know these people and understand them and understand that they have changed in the last 20 years immensely. And this is because a large part of the population has migrated to Iran and Pakistan, as well as in the West. So we used to be a very isolated nation. Nothing from the outside world would actually impact on us. But as a side effect of the war, the 20 years of war, we had huge exodus, which means that Afghans have been exposed to different cultures outside of the country, which has influenced them and which is now influencing Afghanistan because they have returned. And these are the people who have returned with skills, which means that they are occupying jobs that matter. Now, that's one part of it. We also have much more interaction between the rest of you know, Afghans and diaspora communities <laughs> and people on the ground. And in fact, people who have been living abroad have been paying remittances back home, sustaining businesses and families for a long time. So globalization has taken place, has impacted Afghanistan in all its forms, from democratization to various forms of political Islam, which comes from Pakistan, as well as Shiite 
political ideology from Iran, as well as, you know, liberal uh, free market economy to very, very progressive human rights and women's rights and democratic ideas. So what I see reflected in all these discussions of Afghanistan is as a nation that, that has no agency and is just sitting there passively and letting things happen to it. So I see people say, what should we do with Afghanistan as if the people themselves have no sense of, you know, their own country ownership and what they want to do. Uh, so my impression is that there needs to be more engagement with Afghans and, uh, <clears throat> and this is something that I've heard people complain about repeatedly. People don't listen to us. And this is what they say again and again. And it doesn't matter whether they are women's groups or the Taliban or the people in the government. They have a lot of views. In fact, it's a very, very politicized society. Like even children, they, would, you know, they know how to interpret news. They know how to comment. They, they're very, very media survey. They're not just sort of sitting there. So, but what I see is that, that in America somehow, the image of Afghanistan has stuck in that sort of strange, in the Kush, exotic place that hasn't changed, but it has changed because of migration, because the world has come to Afghanistan. And, you know, in order to survive, Afghans pick up quickly. They have to pick up quickly. Otherwise, they wouldn't um, survive, basically, you know. They adapt very, very quickly. I mean, another example is look at how Islam has changed in Afghanistan. In the past, to have suicide attacks was a huge taboo because Afghanistan had, so the form of Islam was localized Islam. I'm, I don't want to be talking too much. What I want to say in brief is society has changed in the last 20 years for war, for migration reasons. It has changed hugely, and we have to take that into account when we look at Afghanistan. Look at it from the prism of today and not 19th century colonialist literature or some sort of old fashioned ideas from the 1980s because. The majority of the population, over 50, are young people under 20 years of age. Now, this is the future of Afghanistan. You know, this is where you have to focus. And these are people who haven't decided yet. So, but Afghanistan, you know, we are more than happy to help. Well. <laughs> if anyone, anybody wants to listen. And, you know, a very good example is that the president is not Hamid Kazai, he's Hamid Kazai. A simple thing like the president's name after eight years hasn't been somehow received. Well, <laughs> anyway, that's it. No, thank I, you. Nisha, Sorry for the rant. I think you've made some really good points, and it somewhat plays to, to Bob's point, which is, but I think it's been a general theme here, is that what's going on in Afghanistan we see is more about us than about Afghanistan, it's all about America, American politics, American power. And one of the interesting alternatives, and maybe the press could speculate on it, some few commentators almost know it is, what would happen if we left the Afghan people to work this out for themselves? Uh, Thomas Friedman kind of made a suggestion in that in his most recent column, which was striking given he'd supported the invasion of Iraq. But I'm going to be a good moderator and follow our schedule because we're going to have lots more time for interaction and questions and discussion. We've just begun to touch on important topics. So we're going to stop, take a 15-minute coffee break, and then we're going to come back, and you will all have a chance to beat up on the press for a lot more time. So thanks to our panel. Yeah, there's coffee and goodies in the sunroom. No one's allowed to leave.